What a powerful documentary we've just seen. I'm Ann Shockett, a sponsor of tonight's event. I'm a media past president of the Nassau County Federation of Republican Women. It's wonderful, actually it's gratifying, uh, to see such a tremendous turnout tonight for this, the Long Island premiere of one of the most vital and worthwhile documentaries seen and awarded the world over. I'm so sorry that the film's executive producer, Steve Emerson, whom you uh, listened to tonight, is unable to join us tonight and enjoy, and enjoy the acclaim in his own hometown of Long Island. Steve uh, sends deepest regards, uh, as you will hear in just a moment, from his right-hand person, the supervising producer, director, and a writer for this documentary, Rachel Milton. A warm welcome for Rachel Milton. scenes, I just want to read the statement from Steve, who would be thrilled to see you all here and feels terrible that he's not. So, uh, from Steve, I apologize for not being able to be here in person, but I'm grateful that you all have shown up for the screening. I also want to express my appreciation to Irene Alter. <laughs> and Shockett. and their colleagues for their hard work in putting this event together. First, as someone who specializes in the area of terrorism, I would like to take a moment to acknowledge the grief experienced by the people of Israel, and especially the parents and families of three teenage sons brutally murdered by Hamas terrorists. I know I am speaking for many of you here tonight, saying that we Americans want to express our full solidarity with the people of Israel, a nation that for so long has yearned to live in peace, but instead has been subject since the day the nation was born to an unending series of terrorist attacks that have killed thousands of innocent Israeli lives. Our own nation suffered the unimaginable calamity of the attacks of 9-11, a day none of us here will ever forget for the rest of our lives. Some of you might recall I produced a documentary in 1994 called Jihad in America. That film focused on the threat of Islamic terrorism from within our own borders. The film captured undercover footage of Islamic terrorists meeting and training within the United States from Boston to New York to Chicago to Oklahoma City to Tampa to Los Angeles. The violent nature of their agenda was unambiguous, but it was only until the attacks of 9-11 that our nation's leaders finally took their threat seriously. The fact that it took images of young men and women flinging themselves to their deaths from the top floors of the World Trade Center rather only sadly reconfirmed to me the famous dictum uttered by one of the greatest leaders of the 20th century, Winston Churchill, when in 1938, as he saw the unfolding Nazi onslaught that so many others wanted to ignore, he said, democracies act when there is blood in the streets. And of course, the corollary being that democracies don't act when there isn't blood in the streets. But now, some 13 years after the horrific 9-11 attacks, I'm afraid we have succumbed to a pre-9-11 mentality. Radical Islamic groups came to realize that they had to reinvent themselves if they wanted to operate freely in the United States. And they did. Instead of spouting radical Islamist slogans, these groups, created for the most part by the Muslim Brotherhood in the United States, anointed themselves as civil rights and innocent political groups who quote unquote condemned terrorism. They created new identities and new names for themselves. They established cozy relationships with the mainstream media, with elected officials in Congress, with law enforcement, both federal and local, with Hollywood, and with local political and religious groups coast to coast. But behind their newfound identities was still the same old radical Islamist agenda, promoting Hamas, the Muslim Brotherhood, and attempting to censor any article, news story, speech, or film that is critical of radical Islam. Amazingly, as they promote their radical agenda, they have continued to deceive the American public that they are quote-unquote moderate. Nothing could be further from the truth. 
That is why I decided to make this film, to expose the deceit and deception perpetrated by radical Islamist groups. And uh, at the very end, he said just to let you all know that there are sign-up sheets for the Investigative Project on Terrorism, Steve's organization, at the back of the room along with um, brochures for IPT. Um, separate from all of that, I really want to get us to introducing Sunni Jasser and to talking about the film. The one, perhaps, uh, you can ask whatever questions you want, and I'll tell you about my love letters back and forth with Abdurrahman Alamudi, who's in prison, or how I was called the Envoy of the Ruthless, which I now have on my business card, by a Muslim Brotherhood uh, businessman in Switzerland. Um, but what I really just wanted to say is that when Steve and I first discussed this project, he said I had two weeks to get it done. And um, it was going to be about radical Islam in general. And uh, at that point I said, good luck, you're on your own. Um, and then we discussed it some more. And um, he deserves a lot of credit because he gave me the leeway to really explore this subject, look at the evidence, and see what I could put together that would be coherent. Little did I know that by focusing on the Muslim Brotherhood, it would also become so timely. Um, it, it has been a very interesting process. And even though it's done, um, I marvel that I still see its relevance and the way that it echoes in government conversation, among other places, today. Um, with all of that said, I'd like to introduce one of my interviewees, uh, Dr. Zudi Jasser, um, who patiently sat for a total of, I believe, six hours when I interviewed you over the course of two days back in January of 2008. Uh, Dr. Jasser is the founder and president of the American Islamic Forum for Democracy, AIFD. He is a devout Muslim. He is the vice chair of the U.S. Commission um, on International Religious Freedom. And um, last but not least, he earned his medical degree on a U.S. Navy scholarship at the Medical College of Wisconsin and served 11 years as a medical officer in the U.S. Navy. Um, his tour of duty included medical department head aboard the USS El Paso, which deployed to Somalia during Operation Restore Hope, chief resident at Bethesda Naval Hospital, and staff internist for the Office of the Attending Physician to U.S. Congress. He is a recipient of the Meritorious Service Medal, and he is currently in private practice in Phoenix, Arizona, specializing in internal medicine and nuclear cardiology. Dr. Zubi Jasser. Thank you, Rachel, and uh, I, I want to thank all of you for coming this evening uh, to listen to, obviously, for those of us who are biased into this work, uh, is what we feel the greatest struggle of the 21st century, but I don't think it takes too much attention to the news to realize that we're not too far off the target uh, on that issue. Uh, I want to thank Steve Emerson for his uh, um, insight and uh, prescience in dealing with this issue. Uh, all of us, as much as we try to do this hard work, we in the, in the, what I consider to be the front lines of the Muslim community, we would not exist were it not for the work of people like Steve Emerson, Daniel Pipes, and others that have really for long been trying to wake up America, and we're still in the process of waking up Americans to the threat. Uh, I certainly view this as a Muslim problem that needs a Muslim solution. You saw that I've testified to Congress, not only that first time for uh, Congressman King, but multiple times since then to various committees. Um, and. We've just moved the needle a little bit, and I think that uh, we have moved it in the right direction. Uh, but ultimately, what I think the documentary, you know, if I tried to think of something for you to leave here with, is to realize that you had a party, the Muslim Brotherhood, that many of us in the Muslim community have been dealing with for generations. And I, I learned, and I talk about in my book, uh, A Battle for the Soul of Islam, um, I talk about that. Uh, Available on Amazon. Yeah, it's on Amazon.com. Simon & Schuster uh, here uh, um, with Threshold Editions. Uh, thanks to uh, Glenn Beck and many others uh, helped me get it published. Um, but ultimately, it's my story. And, and I think what it is, it's not a big treatise about 
theological discourse and how to reform Islam. The last chapter is about the Quran and how moderate Muslims can, I believe, engage with the Imams in the theocratic discussions, theological discussions to defeat theocracy. But ultimately, Muslims are a little bit far from that yet, and I think Americans are too. I think the first step is for you to realize that there are Muslims against the Brotherhood, that it's not Islam and Islamism are two different things, that they are in the same soup, if you will, or floating in the same pool of, of Islam, but there's my Islam and there's, there's a, their Islam. There's not only two sides to this, there's multiple sides, and it can get confusing. And the most confusing thing is in, the, in, the, in America, in the West, the Brotherhood doesn't carry cards. They don't have a, we don't have a party here because we don't have religious parties in America. In Europe, they do exist. They have headquarters in London because Europe, they, they found themselves a little more comfortable because there are some religious parties in Europe, or the Christian Democrats in Germany, etc. So they said, well, why can't we just form a party? And their headquarters are in, in London. But ultimately, while you may see reports that Al-Qaeda is 5% of Muslims, that's a big number, by the way, when you're talking about 1.5 billion people, the Islamist movements have proven in Egypt that they can take over countries with democratic voting, with elections. That doesn't mean they're a majority. Most studies have shown that the ranges of Islamist ideology are between 20 and 40 percent of the population. That's a plurality of significant influence. The problem that happened in Tunisia and, and Egypt and all of these countries after what I consider were the pressure cookers of dictatorship that just opened and exploded after the Arab awakening was that the problem after that is that they're the only organized groups under this nuclear political winter that's existed in the Middle East for 60 years. The only organized groups were the Islamists. And the more they got put in jail, the more they were tortured and, and sometimes rightly, sometimes inappropriately put in jail, the more they became martyrs and the more that fueled their movement. Great example is Turkey. They have slowly taken over Turkey with the AKP by the virtue of the Ottomans and the Turks for many years pushing them underground and preventing a public antiseptic of sunlight against the ideology of political Islam. So the bigger issue, if you look to connect the dots, the reason those dots connect is yes, there are some leaders like Omar Ahmed and Nihad Awad who were part of the Hamas movement. And again, I didn't mention at the beginning, you know, my our, our heartfelt sympathies to the families in Israel that dealt with the, the not the senseless and evil murders of these teens. But as we know in this work, and one of the reasons I'm as pro-Israel as I am, is Israel has been dealing with the threat of political Islam for more than any other free country in the world since its inception. And ultimately, Hamas killed these kids because they were Jewish, not because they were Israeli. This was a religious hate crime. And Hamas fuels its movement. It's an outgrowth of the Muslim Brotherhood movement. And the problem with 9-11, and if you look, you all dealt with this here locally with the museum opening just a few weeks ago. They were all upset about the, the, the Islamist groups in America were all upset that the film mentions Islamism with Al-Qaeda. And as I mentioned in some interviews, what the Brotherhood was the most upset internally in this internecine battle within the Islamist movement, they were just livid with Al-Qaeda because it outed Al-Qaeda took it upon themselves to attack the evil West. The Brotherhood had more insidious goals. They know how to do it. Ten years earlier, they had, they had begun to say, you know what, maybe we need to eschew violence. We're losing some of our own constituencies by doing this. And slowly, they then became more legitimate in Egypt, and they took over a quarter of the parliament under Mubarak. And then he realized they were too powerful, and he put them all in jail and wiped them out of the parliament. And they became powerful again ideologically. And this cycle exists in every Middle Eastern country, from Saudi Arabia with the Wahhabis, to Syria with Assad, to Iraq uh, under Saddam, etc., etc. So ultimately, it's not about the Brotherhood Party, it's about Islamist ideology. That's why these dots all come together. It's sort of like oil coming together in water. They're not going to all, and that's why if you talk to many Muslims, you may know, they're going to say, I'm not part of the Brotherhood, this is a bunch of fear-mongering. That's what they're going to say. And then you start asking them the right questions about Islamism, ask them about Jihad and what they believe, as you saw from the speeches there. That Siraj Wahaj I talk about in my book, how I went to present a paper in a medical meeting at the Islamic Society of North America 
wearing a Navy uniform with my captain, uh, the head of medicine at the Bethesda. We went, he was also Muslim. And we sat in the audience with 10,000 people and Siraj Wahaj gives a keynote, holds up the Quran and says, it is our goal as Muslims to change the constitution in secular, godless countries like America to being that of the Quran. And then later there was time for Q&A and I get to the mic and and uh, um, actually not q and it's time to announce you know, your, your booths and things at the meetings. And I got up and said, listen, this is my first and last ISNA meeting. And number two, if any of you are in the military, you should leave because this is a seditious gathering. You can disagree with policy, but you can't talk about wholesale revolution of the Constitution and change of the government. And this was in the mid-90s. Later, I met my wife uh, five years later um, as I was finishing my last tour of Bethesda actually at Congress, and her parents, I, she wasn't at that meeting, but her parents were at that meeting. And uh, they immediately figured out who I was. <laughs> and, you know, there was no criticism. They, they agreed. Many Muslims agreed with what I said, but not one in that room of 10,000 people came up to me and said, you know, this is right and I'm going to stand with you. This was in the mid-90s. So I didn't come to this as many of the people that Rachel interviewed. We didn't come to this post 9-11. You know, this is a fight we've been doing for since I was a teenager and learned about the MSA at the University of Wisconsin. Uh, but post 9-11, I realized that I needed all of you and that I could no longer worry about dirty laundry and exposing things within our community, that my Muslim communities were not going to wake up to this problem. They are waking up in the Middle East and they're paying for it by being slaughtered. And, and they're being slaughtered, actually, not only by Islamists, but by fascist dictators like Assad. If you read General Keane's editorial in the Wall Street Journal two weeks ago, he very rightly points out that Bashar Assad's military has, oh, coincidentally, not been bombing ISIS and Al-Qaeda camps in Syria. They're bombing the moderate neighborhoods in Aleppo and Damascus, because those are the biggest threat to freedom, to, to bring forth freedom. The ISIS Islamists, the reason they're still in power enough to invade northern Iraq, is he's let them thrive in Syria because the more he has a foil of radical Islam, the more they can legitimize a military dictatorship. And we in America have fed into that by saying that, well, there's two choices in the Middle East, so we have to pick the best of, the, the least of two evils. There is a third pathway, and that's what our work at AIFD is about. It's about a third pathway of liberty. Muslims can go through a reform that ultimately uh, these pressure cookers, when they get opened, if we have a president that has a vision, that has a strategy for the Middle East, there you go. That's the uh, uh, National Security Council monitoring my... Um, so ultimately, this is what this is about, is how do you define moderate Muslims, those that we should engage? You know, today on, on Hannity, we were talking about, you know, what should be... Should we send money to Syria? They're, they're all bad. And yes, the, at this point, it's almost the, the, the Qataris and the Saudis have funded the wrong people. And that's why, because we weren't involved, that the Syrian population has been more radicalized and jihadists who didn't really exist in Syria in 2011 now are flourishing because we weren't involved. It doesn't mean that we're not going to get it wrong in some ways, but the complete absence of American influence has handed Syria over to Iran, and this bizarre scenario where we all of a sudden are on the same side as Iran, which is absurd. And that's what they, and at the end of the day, we have been played like a fiddle by Maliki and Iran. We have been played like a fiddle because this is the dichotomy, just like the Saudis played us like a fiddle, where they said, we are, we are your allies. In the meantime, they fueled to the billions Wahhabi spread of ideology that destroyed our communities, where the MSA was getting billion, you know, millions while groups like ours would go to the mosque and then maybe not go because the imam was just nuts and was saying things that were very anti-American and we couldn't do anything about that. And I can tell you, as much as you may walk out of here tonight very educated about political Islam and understanding by virtue of understanding American history, knowing that in mankind's history the fight against theocracy is, a, is how we formed America. And this is where the Islamic world, the House of Islam is right now. We're fighting against theocracy. The problem is, is the non-jihadist, the anti-jihadist Muslims that are not that 20 to 40 percent 
are divided into 30 different parties. So if you look at the Tunisian elections, they got one, two, three, four percent among each party. So they weren't able to defeat him. So you got the Islamists going to ballot box against Assad or Mubarak. And then, and then ultimately, after that, the Islamists win. And there's nobody with a vision to focus on, well, how do we unite the secularists, the, the feminists, the, the, the non-Islamists who realize that Islamic law is not something government should tell us, but things I should choose on my own, and that's why America is as successful as it is. That the American experiment is a way for us to defeat the Brotherhood. But you have to engage the language. That last testimony, conversation, debate with that member of Congress, I have a transcript similarly in my book about a, an interchange I had with a member of Congress on the same thing. And it was, it was amazing how in America she didn't want, she said I shouldn't be speaking about Islam because I don't have a degree in Sharia. And yet our founding fathers, were there any priests in the Church of England that were ready to, to fight against the church itself? Hardly any. It was really the business community, the intellectual Christians that realized that they didn't want to be run by theocrats. So this is, I think, where our first constituency in the Muslim community is, is Muslims who in, the, in Egypt, nobody would have this ridiculous conversation about not calling them Islam, because in Arabic they're called Islamiyin, they're Islamic movements, as you heard in Arabic, them calling themselves. But yet in America they realize, well, let's neutralize the pro proponents of liberty by making them feel that Islam is Islamism, and therefore they won't even get into the debate. And that's why one of our things we do is we go, when, when imams will agree to debate us, we have Lincoln Douglas debates against imams. We've done it in Ohio and Florida and wherever we can. Oxford, I just came back in May from doing that about political Islam and whether it's a threat and whether Islamic democracy is possible or is it an anathema, which I truly believe it is. So I think that's sort of the way I look at it. As these pressure cookers get opened, they could shift to the worse, as Iran did in 79, where the Shah, who was a dictator, left behind an even worse scenario of now the Islamist revolution in, in Iran and the Khomeinists. Um, or in Egypt, where we saw one year of an opening of society that Mubarak left did more to destroy the ideas of the Muslim Brotherhood than 60 years of Nasser said that and Mubarak. Because they prevented an open society that would be their own death knell as autocrats. So therefore they used the militants to do that. You've sat and seen the movie and I, we're here really to, to answer your questions. Uh, I don't want to take more of your time just talking to you and rather just to answer your questions. And Rachel really is, is a godsend in this work uh, uh, because she really brings to it an object objectivity of a journalist who's looking for answers to questions that she doesn't have the answers before she, she you know, comes to you with them and really objectively looked at a lot of the data. You know, the question I want you to leave here with is how do we get the majority of Americans to begin to change the consensus in this country that political Islam is the problem without making it seem that Islam, the faith, is also the problem. Because if we mix that up, at this point, we're completely absent in the debate. So therefore, the Islamists are running roughshod in America and in the Middle East against the dictators. And the Islamists say that secularism is dictatorship and America is a dictatorship, which is how they present us. So therefore, if you don't have religion and government, you're going to have this evil dictatorship like Assad and Mubarak, which they equate, because we were allies with Mubarak, they equate that, di that type of government with ours. And if we're going to have this debate, America needs, just as Reagan called the Soviets the evil empire, he slowly, press conference after press conference, changed the American public opinion from being very small amount of people that thought the Soviets were a threat to a significant one, that we understood as a majority in America that peace through strength was the way to ultimately defeat the Soviets without firing a bullet against them. We cannot defeat the animal of political Islam that is not only the brotherhood spread to Jamaat Islamiyah where Hassan al-Banna trained Maududi in the late 40s and formed Jamaat Islamiyah to the Islamists of Boko Haram in Nigeria to the uh, Somali group, uh, uh, um, Shabab groups, to all of these are simply the tip of the iceberg. And one of the, I'll leave you with an analogy, which is one of drug addiction. And it reminds me of when I deal with political Islam and Muslim communities, 
It reminds me of the families that are addicted to drugs and it's part of the culture. And then they say, geez, how do we, I can't believe we're losing so many of our kids to drug-related violence, to the violence that they don't connect it to the drugs. And the gateway drug of radical Islam is political Islam. This jihad as being this afterlife and this greatness, unless we as Muslims, and there's three basic concepts that we have to, and I would ask you to engage your Muslim friends on these issues. One is jihad. As long as Muslims link jihad to the state, and the state jihad becomes empowered when you have an Islamic state, because when I served in the military, for example, I could never leave the military before I finished my commitment. If I left, I would either be desertion, as we saw with uh, uh, Bergdahl, or it would be a, 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 a unauthorized absence. So in the Islamic state at the time of the Prophet, if Muslims who were part of the military left the military, they were considered traitors. Well, modern Muslims would say that that just applied to the Muslims at the time there was a Muslim military with the Prophet. That idea of connecting citizenship to military service to the Prophet needs to, be end, needs to end at 633 AD when the Prophet died. Unfortunately, the Islamists say that that doesn't. If you have an Islamic state, then your obligation of jihad applies to the state, and then you get laws of apostasy, you get laws of blasphemy that are equated with sedition. So as long as the Islamic state has oxygen, the brotherhood will have oxygen, and that's how you define Islamists. The ummah is the other concept that needs to be reformed, is that we as a Muslim community, are we just a faith community or are we a state? Because ummah in the Quran also means state. Ask your Muslim friends about those two concepts and I think that will open up a discussion. We need to have these panels in uni universities, in media, etc. So, thank you for your attention. And I really appreciate it. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. To start off our question and answer period, uh, we're fortunate to have two truly exceptional people. After they're done with their initial questions, we will be inviting you, the audience, to ask your own questions. Uh, first, Jeffrey Weisenfeld is a financial advisor and principal in Alliance Bernstein Global Wealth Management's New York office. Previously, he was a regional director with the Empire State Development Corporation and executive assistant to the governor of New York, George Pataki and an executive assistant to U.S. Senator Alphonse D'Amato. Jeffrey serves on the boards of the World Jewish Congress, the Queensborough Community College Holocaust Resource Center, the Open University of Israel, the Salute to Israel, Daybreak Committee, and numerous others. He is Vice President of the American Gathering of Holocaust Survivors and U.S. President of the Israel Independence Fund. By appointment of the governor, Jeffrey has been a trustee of the City University of New York. He earned his BA in political science from Queens College and attended the FBI Academy in Quantico, Virginia. Jeffrey Weisenfeld. Just because uh, I, I like to leave as much time as possible for the audience, so I just have two brief questions. The first one, and I'll, I'll throw them both at you so you can any way you like. It was a pleasure to get to have a conversation with you on the ride out, get to know you as a person better. Uh, the question that comes out of this film more than any other, as you watch the political correctness and the disbelief of the general public and the elected officials and the law enforcement officials, is that if any one of them with their mindset as it is where to watch the film, it's okay, there's a couple of bad people here and there. I think the real issue is how can one create a belief in the quantification of this, that this is really a problem and it's, it's a significant numerical problem, a, num a high number of Muslims that are involved in this overall question. It's not, it's not a group of 10 or 20 or 30, it's, Brotherhood is far reaching. It's a number of organizations, all of their membership. How could the, how could those of us who, who grasp this problem in assisting the Muslim community and the public at large convince those who are the opinion makers that this 
presents a quantity problem. And the second question is, I just wanted to, at random, throw three people that we generally have in the news and whether or not you believe they're part of this problem. I'm just going to name them. Chris Ellison, Con Keith Ellison, the Congress member, Huma Abedin, who worked for Hillary Clinton, and the third one, Grover Norquist. Those are the three. Okay. Um, thank you for that. Uh, first of all, the quantification problem, I immediately had a flashback to a, a very antagonistic interview I had in CNN uh, during the Ground Zero mosque issue, in which I was very much against the, the mosque and uh, being built, not against religious freedom as it was portrayed, but rather against uh, the proposition itself, uh, feeling that it was a $150 million foreign project that had nothing to do with religious freedom. Um, and I wrote about it in the Wall Street Journal, but Elliot Spitzer at the time had a program on CNN and um, asked, asked me why I was so upset about foreign funding, and I talked to him about Islamist movement, and he asked me the same thing. He said, well, this is a small percentage of the Muslim community, you're tarring community in a way that just you have no justification for. And I said, sir, this was before the Egyptian revolution. This was in 2010, as you all know. I said, the percentages range between 25 to 35%. And he laughed and cut me off and said, you have no evidence to say such a thing that 20, so you're telling me that 25, and I said, sir, Muslims that come to this country don't become cleansed of their ideologies upon immigration. I said, my family were political refugees and came here for political ideological reasons were fighting the Ba'ath in Syria and also were anti-Islamist. Many families don't come here for ideology, ideological reasons and are actually in bed with governments there and come here for economic reasons. And sure enough, a year and a half later, two years later, Egypt has elections and the, the Muslim Brotherhood won 35% of the vote the first time around. So that's the percentage if you want to quantify it if you look at the numbers in America, if you simply take the numbers within mosques, and I can tell you from experience having been personally deeply involved in about seven different mosque projects in America, my family helped build three different ones, I can tell you that from the active, very orthodox community, it's not an understatement to say it's at least 70 to 80 percent that believe in the Islamic State concept, or at least will not antagonistically work against it. The rest are simply at the back of the mosque and aren't leading it. In the general community, I think those percentages are less and that it's barely probably 15, 20% that are Islamist. So that's sort of my guess. It hasn't been studied. Even the Pew polls that came out today about how extremism is on the decline, the constituency of the radical groups are down. They're not asking the right questions. This isn't a problem of violent extremism as the Obama administration continues to focus on. It's a problem of the ideologies that fuel it. While the, the, the violent extremists are losing their constituencies, the Islamist movements are actually growing because we are not helping. If the free world doesn't help that third pathway, nobody is going to help them. The monarchs aren't, the autocrats aren't, Russia, China, Iran, they're not going to help the liberals. The West is and we're not doing anything really. As far as the three names you gave, um, who was the first one? I remember the last one. Oh, I have a whole chapter dedicated to Keith Ellison in my book because of how much I think he represents everything that is wrong with our community as far as the inability to take on the ideology. I debated him in Congress thanks to Congressman Trent Franks and others that brought him into a debate that we had and that video is on our website. You can look at it. And he's, first thing he saw up and said, Dr. Jasser talks about political Islam. I've never heard of such a thing. It doesn't exist. And two weeks later, thanks to Steve Emerson, I got a transcript of his talk at a mosque in, De in Dearborn in which he spent 20, 30 minutes basically derailing my organization and saying how we're anti-Islam and Islamophobic. And basically it portrays how here's a gentleman who was the spokesperson for Louis Farrakhan for many years, a vicious anti-Semite who rebranded himself and then joined the so-called mainstream Muslim community and adopted Islamism, but yet knows very little, I think, about the theology of how to counter the ideas within, and simply has done, I think, 40 different fundraisers for care, and is a face person for that. Um, Huma Abdin, 
you know, I think that there's clearly familial issues related to school in a school in Saudi Arabia and others that her family was very much tied to the Muslim Brotherhood and the Islamist movement. Um, I've had my differences uh, with people that have raised her story uh, in that I think that she would not be somebody I would choose to take on head on because she's not said that much personally. And in a country in which we engage people on ideas, it's difficult unless they have a track record. Like Mohammed al -Biyari has a huge track record that Rod Dreher and others have exposed of the defense of Hassan al-Banna and other things. Huma Abdin is one of these likely operators behind the scene who gets our government to do its policies but stays off the radar as far as ideology. So it became very easy to say that she's being targeted because of family and other things. Uh, though she has never publicly, and again, I said this when President Obama initially had as his cultural representative within the Muslim and Arabic community a, a gentleman by the name of Mazen Esbahi out of Chicago. And I wrote a piece about him, critical, even though he personally had not said that much, but he was a, a leader on the board of one of the most controversial mosques in America, which was the, uh, um, in, in uh, one of the suburbs of Chicago, that was a, they were raising money for Hamas, actually, and there was a Chicago Tribune piece about the, it was called The Secret, the Secret Network of the Muslim Brotherhood in 2004. It was done by a Muslim reporter. Four long pieces in the Chicago Tribune talking about the, was it Brookfield? I can't remember the name of it. Lincolnshire or something. But bottom line is, is that he was on that board and never said anything publicly. Bridgeview. 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 The Bridgeview Mosque. He was on that board, never said anything publicly. And to me, somebody who's going to be a public leader in our faith community should at least had been public about his condemnation of the raising of funds. He resigned from the board at the time and did have problems with the fact that they were raising money for Hamas, but never said anything. And to me, that's no different than the Germans who stayed silent as the Nazis came to power. So that's the second. The third, Grover Norquist, you know, that's a tougher question. Uh, Grover has worked with Muslim organizations that call themselves free market, but yet have connections with Saudi funding and other aspects. Um, as much as his whole issue is taxes and, and uh, where I might be on his side on conservative issues, his silence as far as political Islam and the way that he is empowered by virtue of his connections to the core leadership in our conservative community has been very problematic. And, you know, he'll plead ignorance and bring in people like Suhail Khan and others, but the bottom line is, is that if you're going to be a leader, even if you're on the economic side or on the political side domestically, in, the, in any movement, conservative, left or right, as Huma Abdin and others, when you're talking national security today, it's no different than if you're going to be dealing with free markets in the 50s and 60s and you don't think the Soviets are a problem. You know, these are problems. So the Norquists of the world, to me, are problems if they can't articulate the political Islam and the monarchies in the Middle East are a major problem and facilitators, which he hasn't done. I will make this really quick because I do want to answer the questions, but I do want to add a little bit to what Zudi said. Um, in terms of quantification, Jeff, I would say that look at who you're seeing names of organizationally and individually in newspapers, on TV, with government uh, visits uh, to the White House, with law enforcement. Um, my, my cousin is in the FBI, and I get to hear it from that side, as well as Bruce Steve for the FBI. And you hear the same names over and over again, and I think there's a laziness with journalism, and I think if we were to do a quantitative study, I'm sure Steve would love to, um, and that's probably one of the next documentaries in the works, um, about who they go to, who the go-tos are, it's the same people over and over again. And if you were to do a six degrees of separation link chart, well, Keith Ellison was roommates with Nihad Awad, and you know, there's all of these different tentacles um, for how people get to where they are able to influence policy and uh, cultural opinion. Um, people need to be aware that there should be um, diversity of voices. Uh, there's other groups like Zudi's group. Um, why why isn't Zudi on? No offense to you, Zudi, but you should be on TV more. You know, um, you should be quoted in newspapers more. How is it that 
you know, he's asked how many people are in his organization, but nobody asks how many people are really in the Council on American-Islamic Relations. Um, and yet, if you were to count how many times they've gotten press versus Zudi, I mean, it's exponentially more. Um, Did you guys hear that? That their name recognition, the name recognition rate of the Council on American Islamic Relations with Muslims was only 12%. So and this is the group that is the go-to for media and government. Um, and the only other point I'll make is there was a story that I came across while doing the documentary about Muslim visitors that were brought by the State Department to the United States. And the State Department very proudly um, took them to meet with people they felt were very representative of the Muslim community in America. And these Muslim visitors from overseas were blown away that they were looking at their own regimes in the face here in America. They couldn't believe the people that the U.S. had chosen to embrace, and they said, you're picking the wrong people. I don't believe, based on what I've read and heard, that the State Department has listened, um, but that, what you're, that, that people overseas recognize the problem and the U.S. doesn't, um, it doesn't really get to quantification, but it, it sort of does. And also, just for the record, I've been working on an Arabic translation version, not my own translation, thank goodness, of uh, this film, and it is currently being shown in Egypt, and we are getting positive reports. So I just want to mention that. I hope you're thinking about questions because it's the matter of a few minutes. Well, first we have one more person to introduce, and it's my distinct honor to introduce her. Her name is Judy Hershon, sitting at the table next to Jeff. Judy is an alumna of Brown University, uh, earning her BA with a major in history. Judy's a graduate of Hofstra Law School. She's worked as an assistant general counsel for 21 International Holdings Incorporated, a true activist at home on Long Island and in New York City. Judy has served on many prestigious boards, including the American Historical Society and Brown University Hillel, focusing on Israel and campus issues it's Judy's belief that one of the greatest crimes today is the eradication of Jewish history. Please think of your questions, because after Judy's question, we'll be turning the uh, mics over to you. Judy Hershon. Um, Dr. Gasser, in May 2012, I had the pleasure of hearing you speak at American Israel Friendship League event in Manhattan, and it was really a wonderful, I, I don't think anyone understood when they were coming to this event what a giant we had coming to speak to us in person. And it's, it's, just, it's such an honor and privilege to have you right here on the island. Um, my memory is that the law firm where you were scheduled to speak that May was threatened, but the law firm stood firm and you successfully delivered a fascinating talk. One would hope the climate is changing within the American Muslim community regarding attempts to silence speakers, including any Muslim who is in any way critical of Islam, which has done so much to undermine free speech, the foundational underpinning of American democracy, about which you write as eloquently in your book, um, A Battle for the Soul of Islam. I read the book, uh, I bought the book that evening, read it. It's an incredible personal story. And um, this man is an amazing American. I enjoyed so much going over some of the, my memories of the book, and I urge you all to read it. It's, it's just an extraordinary book. Um, the OIC Organization of Islamic Cooperation continues in its worldwide efforts to criminalize defamation of religion within the UN and in negotiations with the United States government. Perhaps you could describe for us the efforts of the OIC and the destructive path being put forth, criminalizing defamation of religion. Thank you, and uh, I'm, I'm humbled by your comments, so I appreciate it. Um, and I'm so glad you brought up the OIC. You know, to me, this is, you, you won't be surprised to see me bring up the OIC in almost every interview I do, because that is the neo-caliphate of the 21st century. And I say neo-caliphate because 
when you look at it, these countries come together internally, they hate one another, right? The Saudis are on the verge of going to war with Iran, and uh, ultimately the, the whole region is on, is on a powder keg right now. Um, but the bottom line is, you go to the OIC website, and we've met with these folks uh, um, in, in various roles that I've had, uh, as I said, on this commission on religious freedom, but I'm, my comments are my own, not related to the commission since it's bipartisan. Uh, but I will tell you that their operation, if you go to their website, is all about putting the West on the defense. It's all about keeping us so worried about offending Islamic you know, sensibilities that we don't realize that their operation is about promoting Islam. And I think one of the first things I testified to Congress was that there were basically two types of Muslims, if you could simplify things, in America. There are those of us who came here to absorb liberalism and, and reform our ideas, and others that came here as political evangelicals to spread the Islamist movement. And uh, there's probably the in-betweens that are just unrelated to either, but the OIC has done that by creating speech laws in which, and they'll do it very deceptively and say, well, like in Lebanon, they'll say, you know, let's criminalize speech not only against Islam, but against Christianity and Judaism to protect the Abrahamic faiths. Meanwhile, it becomes a cover for preventing disagreement where if you look, and, and by the way, the dictators love this because Mubarak and uh, CC Today and others will put people into jail and say that criticism of Islam or criticism of the president is equal to criticizing Islam. So it's a tool that gets used. In Pakistan, it's a military dictatorship. They claim to be victims of the madrasas, and yet blasphemy laws are one of the biggest problems of disputes between families. And the government sort of puts its hand and says, oh, we don't know. And they have impunity problems regarding finding and convicting people. And they say, well, we're not putting these things into place, but yet they don't punish anybody. So. To me, these are some of the core issues, and we could highlight them repeatedly. And where is the liberal media on this issue? The free speech people that allow plays here in New York to exist that, that I think are viciously anti-Mormon, anti-Christian at times, and other things that exist, and yet Islam gets a pass when it's creating radical movements that are slaughtering, picking up girls in Nigeria, and, and making them vanish, to be converted, and all based on coming out of this ideology that Islam should be forced down their throats. So this is such an important thing in the law firm she mentioned. You know, it was amazing to me that it's interesting. Brave people like Steve and I and Hersi Ali and others who are non-Muslim will have halls filled with protesters because the media feeds into that and they say, oh, these are non-Muslims, so we're going to show up, and they show up. With people like me and our American Islamic coalition, they never show up. They don't show up to protest us. They do it behind the scenes. The Muslim Bar Association of New York sent letters to the firm saying, you can't have an Islamophobe like Zudi presenting. The OIC a month ago put out a 100-page report. Four pages of it were about how an anti-Islamic member of the uh, American community was put on the U.S. Commission on International Religious Freedom, proving that they didn't even care that I was Muslim. They were upset that somebody who was exposing what their mission was, was engaged on a, on a U.S. commission to be an independent watchdog on the State Department. And I think it's very important, these groups behind the scenes try to, when you saw that, that Stockton uh, uh, mumbling over his words, he's worried about what pressure he's going to have when he gets out, when the media says, oh, you criticize Muslims, you criticize Islam, etc. And that's what happened with the Ground Zero Mosque on and on, they exact a price to prevent free speech. Ready for questions, hopefully? Yeah. Yes. Okay, uh, Ronnie Kavarian, is she still here? Um, Ronnie is going to be selecting the people to ask the questions. Ronnie is a sponsor, one of the sponsors of this evening, also serves on the board of the Nassau County Federation of Republican Women. Please remember, uh, we haven't had plenty of time but in the interest of getting as many questions answered as possible, please limit this to questions only and not just statements. Thanks, Ron. And who was your question for? Uh, for Dr. Jassa. Okay. Uh, Dr. Jassa, first of all, let me uh, thank you and commend you for uh, bringing this to light. 
uh, and uh, also working on the inside, uh, which I think is a real uphill battle, a very difficult ta uh, task, uh, and one, uh, one problem or quandary which comes to my mind is how is this at all possible uh, with the uh, Koran uh, as it's very, very well known and documented as to its violent passages which instruct the, the believers to commit uh, violence, you know, uh, against unbelievers, the verse of the sword. Uh, one Islamic scholar, I believe, said there were 95 such uh, admonitions no of uh, so, violence. So what you're saying is, so how, how do you... How does this contradict this contradiction? Yeah, how, how does it, how can your movement, you know, to reform from the inside deal with this as, you know, what many people see as a... And I, I think that's a great question, and that's what actually makes us unique, is that on a weekly basis, daily basis, we engage these issues, in that uh, um, we will highlight areas of, you know, for example, Sheikh Kardawi, we will take his passages and criticize them, and, and show how they need to be attacked and criticized from within the Muslim theology, the last chapter in my book is what I call, it's titled Misinterpretations of the Quran, or basically how moderate Muslims can reinterpret those passages. Um, you know, the passage of the sword, as it's called pejoratively, I think, is, you know, our holy books have at the time, you know, in the 7th century when Islam was revealed, there was no secular American type society. Societies were either tribal or pagan, or they were based in faith-based. So to say that, well, because Islam didn't separate mosque and state at its inception, it can never do so, and because the Bible says, render unto Caesar what is Caesar, and unto God's what is God's, therefore it can separate. Uh, I'm sorry, it took the Christendom, took the Christian world 1,789 years until there was a legal framework that actually did that. You know, Islam is 1,430 plus years, is still evolving, and I do think these things can happen. The passage, to me, yes, the, the Islam is not a pacifist faith. There was times in which you could say, you know, that there were battles in which the Quran, that passage, that chapter, Muslims believe, is one of the last revealed chapters. Therefore, unless we think that God contradicts himself, you have to put the context of just war into context of all the other peaceful admonitions from God. Therefore, just like when I was in the military, or if I was serving in Afghanistan and my general would tell me, kill the Taliban where you find them, that is a moral statement when you're fighting for freedom and peace. So if there's a passage in the Quran, and regardless of what narrative you want to use, consider it mythology for non-Muslims. If I as a moral person believe that that was a just battle between those two tribes, God is permitting at that time those Muslims, not profiling all non-believers, which is what Al-Qaeda and the Islamists of the Brotherhood do, but at that moment in 612 AD, which is the battle that's referred to in that chapter, that was not to be profiled into future, but at that time it was a just battle. The Old Testament has different conflicts that it has. So there are ways that Muslims can do it by maintaining, as I believe I'm an Orthodox Muslim, I can maintain my adherence to the authenticity of my text in Arabic, and yet the translations and interpretations are where the, the, the crux is. Because a lot of these things, for example, a chapter that says, don't take Muslims, don't take non-Muslims as friends, the word friends is not friends. It actually, in Arabic, is awliya. Awliya is legal sponsors in legal acts. So if I'm getting married, I couldn't, even though I may marry a Christian, I cannot have as witnesses to my religious contract, kutub, in my faith, I could not have that be a non-Muslim because they don't know my laws. So that's what that means. And so how could the same God tell us not to be friends with Jews and Christians and yet allow me to marry a Christian or Jewish wife? So there's ways to bring one narrative to that which needs reform. And none of the Islamic leaderships, whether they be monarchs of the OIC or clerics, want to do that because they're empowered by the Islamist narrative of the Islamic State. He's asking about Dar al-Islam and Dar al-Harb, which was the fact that at the time of the Islamic formation and inception at the time of the Prophet, it was felt that Islam was bringing a, a more compassionate type legal system to what was pagan Arabia at the time, 
and slowly over time, beyond the time of the Prophet, evolved this sense that there was a place in which the laws of Islam reigned, and outside of it was always a place of war. That's how they divided the world. The moderates of today, like Tariq Ramadan, said, well, you know what, we're going to change that concept and make three worlds, which is the area of war, the area of Islamic law, and the area of contract, which is that Muslims are, aqad, are under a contract when they're a minority. Which basically, which is why I've talked to Rachel, I wish I could debate these guys. You're basically telling, and this is what a mosque head in Iowa told me when I debated him. He said, well, yes, we would never, you talk about it, you know, us wanting to violently overthrow, we would never, we're 2% of the population, we are not anarchists. They're not anarchists, but basically when they say they don't believe in the separation of mosque and state, they're basically admitting that they're an insurgency. So to them, they have a contract as peaceful people that their ends, Al-Qaeda's ends justifying the means may be violence and, and killing innocents. To the Muslim Brotherhood, the Islamists, they may believe that it's about peaceful means through Congress and media, etc. So that's the division of the world. That's one of the concepts when I talked about jihad and ummah. If Muslims reform the concept of ummah, that concept will go away. That there is a dar, an area of Islam, and an area of war. That will melt away if we do away with the concept of the Islamic State. Yes. Um, I had the pleasure of listening to you, I think it was on Dennis Prager's uh, program. Um, anyhow, the uh, question I wanted to ask is that uh, with Hamas you know, in the unity government with the uh, Palestinian Authority, essentially it, uh, the, any United States aid which is going to the PA pretty vast is uh, going indirectly to, uh, to feed Hamas, aside from the uh, radical agenda of the PA to destroy Israel, which it doesn't really be honest about. Uh, uh, I, I think by U.S. law it's justified to uh, stop payments to, uh, to both the PA and the No, 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 no. Uh, I'm getting to it. Chicago. At the uh, Archaeological Museum, uh, at the gift shop, they had, uh, after a um, exhibit on uh, Islam, uh, uh, they had uh, the souvenirs from Palestine that showed Israel as non-existent. Yeah. The, uh, the director there, uh, after having a letter written to him, said he pulled it from the uh, shop. Uh, you know, but it's still the case. And last, in the, um, in all the refugees that are uh, coming to service in the Middle East, especially in Syria. Would you please uh, Excuse me. No, uh, by what means can uh, these immigrants, these people that have come here as immigrants, in screen and kick out uh, the Islamists as well as the people who are legitimately refugees and are uh, seeking asylum here? Thank you. Um, I don't believe that the funding could ever, until we have an administration, State Department, that can filter liberal groups versus Islamist groups, uh, I think that the harm of giving money that ends up in Hamas's hand far outweighs any benefit to think that they can re, you know, help them, uh, that, that would radicalize them more if we pull those funds away. I think they need to understand that we will no longer help to fuel a movement whose charter is genocidal, that cites Hadith, not Quran, it actually cites Hadith, that kill a Jew behind every stone is not from the Quran. That's a so-called saying of the Prophet, which is still part of their core doctrine. So uh, I think that if there's anything we can wield, it's the, the power of uh, preventing them from getting funding. Same thing with Egypt, you know. At the time we were started to give money to Egypt when it was going to go to the Brotherhood. And for those of you who think that, the, you know, Islam is always going to be interpreted as militant, there were ten times as many Muslims in the street against the Brotherhood than there were against Mubarak. Those are not Muslims that don't necessarily, many of them don't, but those are not Muslims that are nominal. Many of them do understand the Quran and don't want the Brotherhood to run their country. So the second thing is, I, I think, you know, your museum question is true in that this linkage of the Israeli-Palestinian conflict 
to, well, if we solve that, then all the other terrorism as being a fuel for terrorism will go away. There is not only a huge denial of the existence of Israel, but they connect it to Western freedom and liberalism. We have, there was a guy who sat, who runs, who used to run CARE, was a founder of CARE in Arizona, had a, a Yellow Pages that he did, a multicultural Yellow Pages, where he refused to list the Israeli embassy and refused to list in the map of the Middle East Israel. This is a common thing that they do all over the country. And I took our organization, translated his Arabic newspaper into English for just three months. And it was the first time that, that, that he sat on the Human Rights Commission for Phoenix. And he was removed within three months because of what he was actually printing in Arabic. So I think a lot of these things are signs of much deeper problems. And probably at the University of Chicago, that's a, a, a sign of a much deeper pathology there. Well, I think if you look, we have a filtering mechanism at our organization, the American Islamic Forum for Democracy. We formed a coalition called the American Islamic Leadership Coalition, and um, um, Abdul Rahman, who was in the movie, uh, uh, helped us uh, form that initially. And he's, you know, we get busy with so many things, but they have to be organizations to me that are openly ideologically working to reform or counter the Islamist movements. There are many Muslim groups out there that are simply humanitarian groups, you know, medical groups, etc., that are probably benign, are not very harmful. But at this point, as we look at, especially with the Arab awakening, not spring, Arab awakening that's happening, if there are groups, and it's not that hard, you know, I mean, granted there are some jihadists that are slippery, but you can realize if they're fighting for freedom because of a jihad or they won't say that they're having it, you know, we talk about a jihad against jihad. Those guys will never say that. And our coalition, we have, you know, we look before they join our coalition, do they have a track record of writing articles and speeches against the Brotherhood, against the Islamists? Have they named them by name or do they just condemn violence? You saw Kerr's answers to Rachel about, you know, whether they will condemn Hamas. They won't condemn them by name. They won't condemn the ideology. They, they deny the Brotherhood existence, which it doesn't necessarily exist in America because it's not a formal party. But the ideology sure exists, and the network behind the scenes does. Yeah. Yeah, so our, we, have, we came down with, on our website at aifdemocracy.org, we have our foundational principles. And those include... Does every Muslim have a right to interpret the Quran or is it only the domain of the ulama or the scholars? Is there an equality between men and women? Do you recognize Israel as a state? These are things that our members have to sign on to and, and uh, including uh, a discussion of a respect for the American Constitution. That's actually our top three is will you defend the American Constitution whether Muslims are a majority, 90% or 2% of the population? Or do you view democracy as shifting the legal constructs? These are all central to weeding out Islamists, and it's worked. We have a youth project called the Muslim Liberty Project, in which we have college kids and kids in their 20s write us essays about these things. And in doing this now for five years of our project, uh, we have one, uh, Samir, he was here in New York, is at West Point, is uh, going to be graduating in a year. And uh, he actually introduced uh, Congressman King at a rally we had to support the NYPD when they were getting all this attacks about some of the projects we, you know, some of the law enforcement that they do. And our essays, just by reading them, we, we asked them, do you think it's okay to question an imam? What do you think about Sharia law? Can you have an opinion about these things? And it, it weeds up. I have yet to make a mis you know, our group, our board has yet to mistake Islamist youth with non-Islamist youth. So when you talk about immigrants and others coming from other countries, I refuse to believe that it, it's not that hard. Just like we filtered communist operatives with the Soviets, we were mistaken. There were the, the walkers and others that we goofed up on, you know, that were in the FBI, that were agents of the Soviets. But for every one we missed, there were a hundred that we got because we knew how to filter for Soviet ideology. We have no filter today. And this gets to the question about Huma and others. How are people like that, especially Mohammed al -Biyari, how is an operative of the Muslim Brotherhood whose organization before he joined the Department of Justice as a Homeland Security advisor was called the Freedom and Justice Foundation. That's what its foundation was called. 
hello, that's the brotherhood, right? I mean, so, you know, we don't have a filter for Islamist ideology. They won't do it. And I've talked to people who, I've asked that, why don't we have hearings about this to the intelligence committees? They go, oh, it's too difficult. We can't do it. It would be too hard, too hard to do. I'm going to try to speak loudly, but a couple of the, and this is just the number. Thank you both. My concern, and I think that I want to share, is what has happened to this. FBI and the redacting of the manuals and the text. And I think we have to share that with people and how the FBI's hands have been tied. So if you could address that. And also the the issue with the OIC and how our State Department uh, under Hillary Clinton posted that in this country and how dangerous that is. And perhaps we should think that maybe someone like Kim Abadi had that kind of influence to have this kind of um, event happen in the country. I'm happy to answer questions, but I'm much more used to asking the questions than answering them. Um, so, and I also just had 70 minutes to kind of speak my mind, and hopefully you enjoyed that. So, I didn't want to be wanted to make sure I was deferential to my hostess. So, um, the OIC question. The first question was about oh, the redaction of the text. Wow, you know, this is a I was actually teaching a part of a course, lecture at the NDU in Norfolk uh, National Defense University, and that entire course was canceled. Now, was all the materials taught at that course great? No, there was some pretty inflammatory material uh, that got released to, um, you know, Wired magazine that I had nothing to do with. If you look at the PowerPoint, there were things about nuking Mecca and other things. So, listen, our the anti-jihadist movement, because we're not engaging Muslims at all in this, does end up with producing things that are very problematic because they're doing it in a vacuum. So what happens is they start producing things that doesn't give space for devout Muslims to take on Islamism. So what happens is now all of a sudden because these slides got released, there was a, there was a complete moratorium on any education about Islam within the security service systems at Homeland Security, FBI, etc., and they're waiting for hearings. Those hearings have yet to really happen. We don't know what's happening. All I can tell you is that since then, even though thanks to Steve's work and others, there is actually law that the FBI openly said they will not engage care. There's an open memo to Frank Wolf and others that said they will not engage him, and yet they violated that on multiple occasions because of this engagement of Islamists and feeling that these are the representatives of our community and until we figure out how to educate you know and, and we should have a debate I told them they don't need to figure it out just take people from our coalition and put the Islamists there and have us all educate them on Islam and see the debate and let the fireworks fly when when uh, just like it does on the streets of Cairo without weapons right and at the schools at NDU and in the Pentagon and elsewhere and you will slowly begin, they will be, get a huge education, but right now there's none of that. So as a result, you find, you know, Nidal Hassan's resume, he was floating around Walter Reed just like I was. I was at Bethesda, he was at Walter Reed, I didn't know he existed. But come on, he had a card that said Soldier of Allah and nobody said anything because of this issue. The OIC and, and what they're doing, uh, you know, there was some aspects of what Secretary Clinton said when they came here that was very good. Her 10-minute speech she gave was fantastic about how we were different from, from the OIC standards. And that she actually told them, she said, if you guys actually had faith in your own religions, you would not create laws that made out laws against blasphemy, etc. So she said that, but she made that meeting closed door. There were no media invited, and it was all these protections to make sure they weren't perceived as anti-Islam. And I'll tell you, this didn't start with the Obama administration. President Bush started by sending a listener, not a participant, to engage and criticize the OIC. We sent a listener there to sit down and do nothing but absorb an apologetic fashion to the OIC, which we never had before, which they thought was an advance. We should have taken on the OIC from the time 9-11 happened as being the primary source of the threat to America. Sorry, I do want to add one point. You just said that we it, it didn't start with 
the Obama administration and also, just to be clear, didn't start with the Bush administration. I mean, back as far as Eisenhower, um, Hassan al-Banna's son-in-law was photographed next to Eisenhower in the White House because uh, I believe it was the OIC or it was the MWL, the Muslim World League. One of the two organizations chose Hassan al-Banna's son-in-law because he had kind of an American flavor. Um, and he could be kind of like their Muslim Billy Graham in the White House. So this has been going on for a very, very long time. And I will tell you, I often give them a pass before the end of the Cold War, because the, the Middle East was sort of a playground for this conflict between us and the Soviets for so long that we were picking dictators, and we were on Saddam's side, as you know. So, you know, I get that that was an issue, but the reason Steve's work in the 90s, nobody paid attention, was once the cold, once the wall fell, we finally started to realize, oh my gosh, these dictators have been brewing this stew of radical Islam, and Steve was prescient and a few others were, but nobody paid attention until 9-11. Uh, Thank you for being here. So, uh, you talked about the seven uh, mosques that you found. You talked about the seven mosques that you found put together, and it's great. But as I understand that there are something like 2,500 or 3,000 mosques in America. And unlike Judaism or Christianity or other denominations, there's no uh, yeshiva or, or uh, school in America to train imams. They come from other countries. And uh, you know the largest mosque in America is a Shia mosque, Rabbi uh, uh, Imam Kazwini. You know, the challenge I have is about, is about language. You can say 30 to 40% uh, radicalized. Uh, and we should start, you know, retraining in, in the mosque. But Muslims think that they're devout. Those 30 to 40 percent, they describe themselves as devout. And Erdogan says that uh, the term moderate Islam is ugly and offensive. There is no moderate Islam. Islam is Islam. So there's one Islam. Right. There's one Islam. And uh, you know, we're not Muslim. They don't give you the time of day. And who's going to re-educate them? Yeah, I think, you know, that's a great question. What do we do with imams, the mosques, etc.? cetera? Um, you know, I, I, I don't think the solution is going to come from the imams and the mosques. There's one Islamic university, Zaytuna Institute, which has never taken on the Islamic State concept. Uh, the New York Times uh, reported on them um, and said that they were sort of the future of moderate Islam. They interviewed Zaid Shakran at the end of uh, Lori Goodstein's report on it. She has a quote from him in which Zaid Shaker says in this article in 2006, he hopes and prays that America becomes an Islamic state. And she reported that in a, in a favorable way because to her Islam was like a peaceful thing. And I wrote a, a column in the Washington Times and then Bill Moyers interviews her, interviews him later because that column I wrote exposed what was, you know, Zaid Shaker and the fact that that institute, um, the head of it, uh, was meeting with President Bush right after 9-11 as being so-called the future of modern Islam. And uh, Moyers basically got him to say that, well, he didn't mean, he meant as far as, you know, sharing Christian and Jewish values, etc. So nobody ever takes on these things. I will tell you that, you use the term radicalized. We have to be careful. I said they, they were 30 to 40 percent Islamists. Radicalized to America means that they're militants that will do things violent to achieve their means. I've never, and I testified to Congress, I've never met a Muslim that believes you should blow up buses and restaurants and, you know, like we see in Hamas and others. That has told me to their face. I've met them give apologetics for it, but I've never met one that thinks that that's the right means to do it. So the Islamist ideologues, the bigger problem, that 30 to 40 percent, is the ideologues that think that, well, the means is wrong. We have to figure out a different way to get to that Islamic state, which is the bigger problem. And I will tell you that, you know, as much as I think that 70 to 80 percent of mosques are run by Islamist political ideologues because they don't understand America, because they don't understand that Islam can be reformed, that the Islamic State is not this utopian concept, it will always be a theocracy, it will always fail. These things, when we teach our youth, they never be, they, they become inoculated against Islamism. But once they're Islamist, it is very hard to get them to become, that's why we focus on our youth program. We, we thought, we use the debates as tools to expose their ideas. I never debate these guys thinking that I'm going to convert them out of Islamism. It's impossible. Do you think that uh, when Hadley says, 
hijack the religion. Over 30%, 30 percent of Muslims worldwide are devout, or whatever that is. Do you think that um, that's a fair statement, or do you think that uh, that, that troubles me? Well, I mean, that's, you know, the bottom line is, is you have 1.4 billion people that have been getting their information about their faith controlled in a, in a very suffocating fashion by dictatorships in which there's no free media. So to think that somehow they're going to think Islam is moderate and classical liberalism is absurd. The concept of many Syrians, the reason my family was so anglophilic was they were educated at London University. They, they uh, went to the West and came back and had a core belief and a, and a love for Western ideas, but many in the, in the Middle East are taught that the West is anti-Islam and, you know, the American Revolution was this bizarre narrative that they have. So, you know, the bottom line is, is that this is why we have to start with getting the West on the right page, because the Muslim communities is going to take a lot longer. And even having said that, 70% are not Islamists. They know they don't want it. Egypt proved that. But they also don't know how to debate them inside the mosques. So before we get inside the mosques, then we have to uh, uh, train them. I just, our conversation in the car was also about who goes to the mosque versus those who don't go to the mosque. And it's a much smaller percentage that go to the mosque than don't. I think that's an important point for you to elaborate on. That's very important. The Pew poll looked at this five, six years ago, just simply numbers. And uh, the mosque going great, 25 to 40 percent of Muslims go to mosque once or twice a year. 10 percent go more than four to five times a year, okay? So, initially I started working with the mosque community. When we, when we had our rally against terrorism, and I talk about this in my book, I thought I could get the Council of Imams in Phoenix to join me. Even with a state newspaper and, a, and an unsigned editorial telling them, told the Council of Imams if they don't show up with Dr. Jasser and his organization, that they will be perceived as condoning terrorism, none of them showed up because they wanted to make statements that were apologetic. So they are the source of the problem. But if you look to engage Muslim community, this is what I tell the FBI and others when they knock on our door. Don't engage them based on Dr. Google and Yellow Pages, right? Engage them based on who are the Muslims on hospital staffs, at bar associations, not all the bar associations, some bar associations, uh, nursing staff, rotary clubs, civic clubs, in your communities, your private business communities that you know that are Americans that happen to be Muslim not Muslims that are wearing their faith on their forehead and engage in an Islamic political movement to defend Islam, because those are the ones that are part of this movement. The ones that are regular Americans that came here like the rest of our families to escape that, do need a fire under their feet to say, hey, your faith is being, not hijacked, is being controlled by a huge power structure that you are allowing to be controlled by a small segment of your faith because the rest of you are asleep. Okay, ladies and gentlemen, Dr. Jasser, Grace Signal, what do we say? Thank you. Thank you so very, very, very much.